Well, welcome to the Robert Walters 2016 uh, Salary Survey launch event. Uh, my name's David Swan and I'm the Managing Director for uh, Robert Walters in Japan and Korea. And uh, I'm joined here today by my uh, guest speaker, Dan Slater, um, who I'll ask to introduce himself in, in just a minute. But before I do, I'll just let you know that we're actually filming this today. And so uh, everything that we say is on the record. And uh, just to let you know that after we've finished this, we will be posting it up on our Robert Walters website and it will also be up on YouTube for those people who want to access or go back over comments or anything like that or share it with colleagues, friends, whoever. So uh, that, that will be available. So without further ado, I'll, I'll ask uh, my guest here, Dan Slater, to introduce himself briefly to you all. Uh, thanks very much, David. Uh, great to be here. I, I'm very pleased that there's a sort of continuity. I, um, last year it was Graham Davis, who was actually the guy that hired me at The Economist. Um, and this year it's me, so uh, thanks very much, David, for having me along. Um, I run something called uh, the Delphi Network, of which uh, David is a member, so thanks uh, again, uh, David, for that. Uh, the Delphi Network is, uh, is a business think tank and information sharing platform. Um, before that, I was uh, running the Economist Corporate Network at, uh, uh, in Tokyo, and I think uh, I, I know uh, several of you uh, from that, uh, Gerald Lima and, uh, and Bartek and so on. Um, I came to Japan in uh, 2008, uh, basically because I have a Japanese wife, so my employer in uh, Hong Kong at the time uh, was Haymarket Publishing, and they said, you've got a Japanese wife, you're clearly the ideal guy to, uh, uh, to go to Japan. Um, I was very happy to come to Japan because I just had spent 12 years in China. Um, I actually did, uh, studied uh, Chinese at university, um, but 12 years in China, I think, is, uh, is, uh, <laughs> is, a, is a fairly long time to spend in that country. It's very fascinating, but it was, uh, it was certainly with, a, with, a, with great relief that I, that I came to Japan, and I've been uh, very happy here since. Um, anyway, let me hand it back to, to David on that note. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Just before I get into the results of the salary survey itself, I just thought I'd take a minute to update you on some of the things that have been happening at, at Robert Walters. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, 2015 was our 15th anniversary in Japan. So we've been here now quite a while. We had a, a 15th anniversary party to celebrate that event, to which we had a, a large number of actually people in this room. Uh, we're also lucky enough to have been awarded uh, Recruitment International's uh, International Recruitment Company of the Year for Japan, and also the FMCG and Consumer Products C Recruitment Company of the Year for 2015. We also uh, celebrated a record three consecutive years of double-digit percentage growth year-on-year year for Japan. Uh, so it's been, uh, been going quite well for us. The salary survey itself, just a, a bit on that, uh, this is actually the 17th edition of the salary survey. It gets uh, thicker and thicker each year with all the, the different uh, businesses and countries that we've added to the Robert Walters portfolio. But uh, what we've hoped this year we've been able to do is to perhaps make sure that we've condensed it down just to the most important bits of information uh, rather than just giving you absolutely everything. Uh, it's now considered the most comprehensive report of its kind in the world. Particular highlights from the 2015 uh, survey are, we've seen, and I'm going to concentrate on Japan now, but with the continuing positive economy, uh, generally, uh, the Japan recruitment market was very buoyant uh, throughout 2015, particularly in the Tokyo metropolitan area. Uh, despite an increased willingness to move on the part of candidates, uh, good candidates across most skill sets were in short supply. Nationwide, the ratio of open jobs to job seekers uh, rose in November to 1.25 open jobs for every job seeker. And then in the Tokyo metropolitan area, it got as high as 1.85 uh, open jobs for every job seeker. And that ratio has continued to rise month on month for the last couple of years. So I think what's, what we're seeing here is a pattern of a continually tightening labour market for Japan. And uh, these numbers that I've presented as well uh, will vary greatly depending upon the industry and skill set that you're looking for. In certain industries and skill sets, it's in some cases as high as five open jobs for every job seeker. So it's, it's a pretty tough landscape out there. 
Moving into sector by sector, the financial services sector has, has been an interesting one over the last couple of years. We've seen a little bit of a recovery there, uh, particularly after the global financial crisis when times were, were very tough for a few years there. And uh, we saw solid hiring activity across uh, banking, securities, insurance, asset management, and real estate throughout 2015. In particular, demand were skills in the area of accounting, audit, risk, uh, actuarial skills, compliance, internal recruiting, junior operations, IT development and security, and project management skill sets. So that was, it was pretty active across all those areas. Um, we did, however, with, especially within the investment banking security sector, see a little bit of a slowdown in hiring towards the end of 2015 and uh, note that it's been a little bit of a tough start to the year for that particular sector. However, uh, good candidates making moves within that industry throughout 2015 were seeing uh, about 10% increases on the job change in, in, their, in their salaries. Uh, the information technology sector was also particularly tight as the supply of skills there uh, has progressively been falling behind the growth of new roles in areas such as cloud computing, uh, big, big data, cyber security, internet of things and online marketing. And uh, talented candidates in these areas were seeing salary increases of up to 20% on the job change. In the industrial sector, uh, companies in automotive, energy, infrastructure, chemical and, ge and general manufacturing uh, all actively sought and struggled to hire engineers, accountants, quality assurance people and HR business partners. And the can good candidates in this area were also able to command uh, salary increases of up to 20% on the job change. Was also, uh, this trend was apparent in the Kansai region as well. In the consumer and retail sectors, uh, demand was high for sales and marketing professionals from country managers through to junior salespeople, including those particularly with Mandarin and English speaking abilities in the retail sector to serve the growing number of Chinese and other tourists visiting Japan. And we also saw solid demand for financial planning and analysis HR generalists and IT professionals. The healthcare sector was particularly tight and, and hard for medical devices companies to find general manager level talent and candidates with startup and regulatory affairs quality assurance experience. In the pharmaceutical sector, uh, there was high demand for a range of specialties in uh, specialists in therapeutic areas in Tokyo and uh, due to outsourcing in the Kansai region, increased demand for people to join clinical research organisations and contract sales organisations. Top candidates in this area were able to command salary increases of up to 10% on the job change. Also, uh, due to an availab uh, the strong availability of, of permanent opportunities and the typical Japanese preference for uh, permanent jobs, uh, we're starting to see some rises in contract rates uh, to attract good candidates into contract roles. And I think that's a trend that we, we will continue to see uh, going forward if, if current economic conditions prevail. So uh, that, that's the overview of, of where we saw the market. And uh, yeah, talking about current economic conditions, I thought it's time now maybe for me to hand it over to my uh, co-speaker, uh, Dan, to uh, give us an overview of what might be driving some of this in the, in the broader economy. Thanks, Thanks very much, David. Um, uh, clearly, um, uh, forecasting and talking about, we've been talking about 2015, but also we want to look at 2016. Everything can turn on a dime. Uh, if everybody needed any evidence of that, I've got four minutes, so I'll just keep an eye on the, on the, on the watch. Uh, then uh, last week uh, would, would, would show that it's very difficult to know what's going to happen in 2016. So obviously, everything we say, uh, take with a, with a pinch of salt. Um, Certainly, my friends of mine in finance in, in London are, are now sort of getting increasingly worried that the end game is, uh, is coming on, that um, you know, we're going to have another, perhaps another round of uh, quantitative easing, and then, uh, and then all bets are off, and uh, serious doubts about the credibility any longer of the European Central Bank and also of the, uh, of the BOJ. 
Um, let's come back to the employment issue. I think from an economist's point of view, it's, it's very interesting. It's actually very complex in Japan. Um, and uh, there were a couple of things that when, when David was telling me about the survey that, I, that, I just, that caused me to try to put, put the different uh, parts together. And it was surprisingly difficult. Um, so we're talking about a, a, quite, a, quite a tight labor market. Obviously, we're talking about the sample in, in, in the survey, which uh, let us sort of reaffirm is uh, the, the client base, which is 85% uh, uh, foreign invested enterprise or foreign enterprises and around 15% uh, uh, Japanese. So that obviously gives a specific look at the, uh, uh, at, uh, at the results that we're looking at. Um, but you know, looking at GDP, you wouldn't expect necessarily a, a huge push to a, a very a, a ratcheting effect. You know, we had 1% last year. Uh, we're probably going to have 1% this year. You know, uh, we, 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 we used to hearing a very tight labor market in China, but of course that's growing even, even in a bad year at 7%. seven, uh, 7 so it's interesting to look at, uh, you know, why, why, why it's so, so tight in, 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 J in Japan. I think one of the, the, slu the answers I came up with was there's a kind of stacking effect. So various uh, aspects contribute. Um, so as I say, you know, GDP is not a huge aspect. It's growing quite slowly, but it is growing. And if you look at it on a per capita basis, it's actually 50% higher than that um, because, you know, the, the population is shrinking quite quickly, but GDP is, is growing gently. So that could uh, provide uh, uh, some impetus towards the tightening labor market, uh, but not, not necessarily a huge amount. Uh, but then you look at FDI, foreign direct investment, you know, often a, a black, a, a very, a black hole in, uh, in Japan, something that doesn't really quite occur. Uh, but you know, you look at FDI in Japan and you've had three consecutive years of, of, rising, uh, of rising growth, rising investment. Um, so it's still very low by global standards. It's 3% of GDP, as, as you all know. It's 10% in China, but much, much larger GDP is 22% in Germany. But still, you've had that, that growth. And actually, I was surprised to see the latest figures on Jetro is that uh, foreign enterprises, so obviously globally, not just Western enterprises, uh, employ 600,000 people in Japan, which is sort of, you know, um, sort of 1% of the, the, the total uh, workforce of 66 million or so. Um, so, you know, you're, you're seeing another uh, sort of a, a stacking effect in terms of the, the, the growth there. Uh, there. Um, maybe adding to that FDI aspect and the, the search for, of course, Western companies are looking for the same people as, as you are, which adds uh, to that, uh, adds that stress. You've got Japanese companies also looking into that area, also wanting to globalize. Uh, that's a big trend, which I don't really need to, uh, to, to, to dwell on. Uh, I think it's, it's certainly something that was perhaps taken a little bit skeptically at first, but does seem to be, uh, I've spoken to people as Japanese companies which started introducing English, uh, and actually some of it seems to be genuinely taking off. So they are now competing with the kinds of people that you used to think were the special preserve for you. Toshiba Corporation, Sharp, all showing that the traditional Japanese model needs to sort of uh, uh, change around and become more flexible and widen the net. People are saying, no, stop looking exclusively at Waseda and Tokyo University. Time to look at, uh, at different aspects, uh, of different, uh, different types in the workforce. Um, and finally, just a comment about uh, the unemployment situation. Uh, the unemployment, again, looks, you know, a bit of a paradox here. It's very low, 3.5%. Any European country would, you know, would give its uh, right arm for that kind of rate. But the Japanese unemployment rate is, always looks very low, um, and it's very hard to compare globally. So, so um, what does that actually mean? I and mean, there's, a, there's a lot of categorization issues. You know, what is categorized as not being in the labor force? I, so if you're not in the labor force, you're not looking for work. So various technical aspects can, uh, uh, can, can affect that. Um, and if you look at in Japan, it could well be that you know, certain groups like young people, old people, women are not in the labor force because they've given up. They're not really looking. I mean, they, it might be they don't really don't want to work, but it might be that they feel that given the very rigid Japanese labor market, there's not the right kind of job out there, which again will make the, which will flatter the, the, uh, uh, the, the unemployment rate. Um, um, and of course, youth unemployment is, is, uh, is, is a very interesting issue. But I guess the, the takeaway I had from looking at these issues was that there's a massive and perhaps unprecedented convergence of people, uh, of firms looking for the same people, whether it's Japanese firms, Western firms coming in. Um, and, and if you're looking at the way industries are structured, this is what really struck me. We're talking about Internet of Things, digitization. Before, if you were an engineer, you worked in engineering. If you were a designer, you worked in designing. I'm seeing a massive convergence across all those industries. And there's, only, there's still only the same sort of percentage of people uh, who can actually handle the, the, the digital aspect of things. So you've got all these different industries where you're talking about manufacturing 2.2, you're talking about marketing for a bog standard toilet roll company, you're, but they all need that same skill set. So um, going back to this issue of you know, uh, labor shortage and prices go, and, and, and wages, um, 
the way I see it is that some areas are going to be re are going to see real huge price rises, wage rises, and others are going to be uh, much uh, much more sort of stagnant. But uh, David, what, what are you, this is one of the things that we, we, we discussed in the, the, the surveys. I, the first thing I said was that actually that although foreign firms obviously tend to get a 30% premium in terms of wage ranges over Japanese firms, which is amazing, 30%, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big chunk of change. In the survey, you don't see, you see spots of increases, but overall you don't see a, a great change. And we, we call this the dog that didn't bark. So what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think the main thing, Dan, is that um, we've been in a deflationary environment for the last 20 years, really. I mean, despite a few ups and downs. And what's been happening mainly is that people have been seeing, without any sort of increase in their, their salaries, um, prices have been coming down. So without salary rises, they've been feeling better off. Uh, that, that doesn't push people to ask for more money. Uh, and I also think that if I compare, say, uh, Japanese culture versus uh, many other cultures around the world, I, I think the main focus of many Japanese candidates is, is not money when looking at a job. It's other factors. And so uh, I've also seen situations where when you throw a lot of money at a candidate, uh, that can scare them off rather than, than attract them. So um, that's sort of, there's, there's a mindset that's around different things. It's a, the, the things that Japanese candidates look for are more based around security and the ability for them to be able to work consistently and grow within one organisation. So, so that's driving one thing. Um, the other thing that I think in general <clears throat> that we don't see too much amongst the, the foreign companies uh, but exists prevalently within Japanese companies is I think age-based seniority, the, the Nenko Joretsu system within Japanese companies also tends to work to suppress salary le levels a little bit because what you tend to find is people who are all at the same age getting paid the same amount of money. And so everybody feels they're being paid fairly. So uh, there isn't a great impetus to ask for more money, and it's, it, why would you? You, you? you know, you're 30 years old, that's what 30-year-olds get paid. So I think that tends to suppress salary levels to a degree as well. And Dan, you mentioned this 30% uh, premium that exists uh, for, I think it's a really a 30% premium on global skills, rather than... Uh, foreign companies you know, pay necessarily having to pay more. I, I just think that there's a premium that gets paid for people who are, are bilingual and, and have professional skills. Mm, mm. And I think that's, uh, that's a driver. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so you're getting this, uh, it seems to me that you're looking at a sort of a two-tier labor market in a sense, right? I mean, and, and, and I think one of the things that struck me when we were, when we were talking about this is that you're a mid-career specialist. And I was thinking, what is so significant about a being a firm which is a sort of mid-career specialist. And I was thinking that really this, this issue of um, you know, hiring people, um, or, or as you said, people like Japanese, there's a tendency or there's a desire to be within the firm and develop gradually. It seems to me that in a sense now, uh, firms are having to hire the people. There's a, there's a big gap in the, profi in the, in the demographic profile of, of firms because there's been a lot of layoffs in the 1990s. People got rid of their the young guys, it's always the young guys that get penalized in, in a recession, right? So, um, you know, smart old guys like myself and David, we always protect our jobs, right? So it's always the, it's always the, the lower ranking guys that get swept out. And that's a problem all over the, all over the world. Actually, there was a great story uh, in one of the, 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 the weekly magazines about this. Uh, something like, I mean, a hundreds of, tens of millions of people, uh, youth unemployment being a, being a massive global scourge. In Japan, it's a little bit more difficult because once you get out of that system, you're, you're not back, it's very difficult to get back in again. So those young grads that got on were then sort of discarded. Um, and they're kind of a reserve army of the unemployed, to use that term that Marx used, right? So, but of course, they don't have the skills. So they're applying for all the unskilled jobs, and you're getting that uh, situation where um, you know, lots of people are applying uh, for jobs, but without the right skills. So it's not really that it's a demographic issue, right? I mean, actually, in certain areas, you've got too many people for sort of low-skilled jobs, and they're finding it difficult to, to, uh, to, to uh, and they're finding it difficult to get employment. But then on the skilled area, you've got these, you've got a, a hole in the middle of the companies, right? Because they haven't been training those people coming up. That, that's, that's, that's a gap, that's an absence, and they're having to turn to uh, uh, recruitment firms like, like, like David's, and and, and look, for, look for those mid-career people. Is that, would, you, would you agree with that, David? Yeah, I, I think that's, 
<clears throat> pretty true, Dan. I, mm. uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, just to sort of put some numbers around uh, the point you were making about the fact that uh, there's a, there's a, there is a massive skills match mismatch between uh, the skills that are in demand and, and what's available. So I mentioned those uh, you know, av available jobs to job seekers ratio and the fact that there's a, a huge surplus of jobs. But within that, if you look at the population of and the breakdown of, of skills available in the population, about 50% of those job seekers are in skill categories where there's only about 0.3 to 0.6 open jobs per, per job seeker. So uh, that, that's but, something that you, know, you don't see in the figures and, and the fact that for some people, it's, it's actually still very difficult to find a job. And as mm -hmm. Dan's alluded to, it's not very easy for those people in often, often to retrain. Uh, yeah. and, and to develop a new skill set. Yeah, 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 yeah. So an oversupply of jobs in some areas, a massive oversupply of labor in some areas, and a massive undersupply in other areas. Um, and I think that's very interesting. It goes back, you know, we've got some HR people in the room today, and, and this issue of retraining. A lot of people I speak to say, you know, once you're 55, I'm not that far off 55, so I, of course I, I, I strongly deny this, but you know, there's no chance of retraining. You know, you've got to move on and, uh, and, and do something else. Um, but, you know, when I look at the, the retraining infrastructure in Japan, it doesn't seem all that developed. I mean, uh, Scandinavian countries spend about 1% of GDP on retraining, uh, which is a massive amount of money to upgrade the skills of their workforce. Um, here in Japan, of course, you've got this interesting issue where um, um, there's a two-tier education system as well. So if you look at the secondary education, and again, this goes back to uh, bringing in new grads, which people haven't been doing recently. In 2009, 2010, 2011, people stopped hiring new grads or they got rid of the existing new grads. But actually, the Japanese secondary school system is really superb at preparing, pe preparing new grads. You know, nobody in Japan is illiterate. Nobody here lacks numeracy. Look at the PISA scores. You know, Japan leaves the US in the dust. Okay, Japan is way ahead. Uh, the, the issue is that if you don't get the training inside the company, uh, you don't get the training because the universities don't really provide the training. I think we've, we've all heard, we've all got friends in academia and you very, very rarely hear an academic who says that the Japanese ed tertiary system is really up to global level. I think everyone knows that the secondary system, although it's not actually debated that much, is actually really superb, but the tertiary system is not that good. Then you don't get the apprenticeships that you get in Germany um, and other North European countries, so you don't get that interaction between academia um, and, and the workforce and, and companies. So really you do, and it all feeds into this, uh, this, this, this massive skills gap, which again means that while you're all chasing uh, a, a, a relatively small number of people, and this, that pool of people, as far as I can see, is gonna continue to shrink. Uh, but I just wanted to pick up on something that David mentioned about, um, I think it's a great point about the fact that everyone's paid the same so no one feels upset, right? It doesn't matter how high the level is. I think that's a, psychologically, that's a great, great point, and I think uh, intuitively, uh, it actually seems a genius way of, uh, of, of paying people, right? Just pay them very low, but pay everybody the same, right? And there's not going to be any competition. But, uh, but obviously, Western firms tend to take the easy way out, in a sense, and just chuck money at uh, candidates, and they can't understand why they wouldn't come if, there's, if you don't chuck enough money. Everyone has their price. So what, what do you think firms need to do in Japan in order to sort of attract people beyond the money aspect? And is this something that HR people need to sort of think about carefully, and CEOs, of course? Well, I... I Actually, you, I think you raised an interesting point there about the, the, the education system and, and the preparation skills. So I might just quickly yep. um, touch on a point about that that uh, is probably interesting and relevant for a lot of people here. Uh, what we see is usually not a great lack of, of technical skills. Uh, what, what seems to be lacking much more from the education system is uh, English, la English language training. And I think one of the big things that uh, is a real challenge to find in Japan, as probably everybody in this room could attest to, uh, is good, technically qualified, bilingual staff. Mm. And there's, the reason for that is pretty plain when you look at the, where, where Japan sits in terms of English language ability. Uh, Japan's actually got the third lowest level of English in Asia. Uh, it's, uh, it's gone, and it's actually fallen backwards. Uh, la the last time I, I looked at stats for this, it was the fourth lowest. It's gone now to the third lowest, wow. um, and it's right next to, uh, right between uh, Afghanistan and Tajikistan <laughs> uh, on, on the graph. 
So uh, mm. even North Korea has better better English than uh, than Japan. Jesus. So um, it's uh, it's a bit of a dire situation in that sense. So uh, that that's that's a major challenge. But um, you know, to get back to the point on, on money, and if, if money's not a major challenge, then how do firms attract uh, well qualified, you know, bilingual technical candidates to their organisations? And I think not to say that money is not at all important. You do have to be offering a you know a sensible, competitive market level salary. Uh, if you're not, people will sense that. But I think more so firms need to focus on selling uh, the non-monetary aspects of a job. And the, note the word selling because uh, recruitment is really all about selling. You are selling your organisation to a prospective candidate. You've got to make it attractive and compelling. And how people do that, I think, is, is focus on things like training and development opportunities. Promotion and international transfer opportunities. Uh, the office environment and location. Uh, it's amazing how much Japanese candidates will put a premium on a really good office location and a nice office. Particularly uh, a lot of the Japanese ladies, the female candidates tend to, to really appreciate that. Uh, also, I think flexible work styles where possible. Uh, that certainly helps to attract uh, working mothers and the like. Uh, to the extent it's possible, I think there's also something that I'm not fully in agreement with the, the, in the modern sort of idea of, of work that all jobs can operate you know, flexible work styles. Fundamentally, I don't really believe that. I think there are certain jobs that are just not structured towards a flexible work style and, and we have to live with that. Um, but uh, to the extent it's possible, I think we should. Uh, I think focus on also selling the, the exciting opportunities that, that exist within the job. Uh, very often there are opportunities to travel, to meet interesting people, to work on interesting problems. Uh, these are things that companies could also be selling. And uh, another thing that I think you've also, is worth targeting, certainly for the younger generation, is CSR activity. A lot of companies lose sight of this, but the, the early 20s really do look at this, this as an area um, when they're considering a company. They've all been brought up with the, you know, the Facebook generation and, and this type of thing. And so when they join a company, they want to feel that that company is, is doing something to make the world a better place. And uh, as cheesy as it sounds to people in probably many of our generation, uh, it's, it's something that they consider very important. And so for the younger types, the more you can emphasize this, I, I think the better. Uh, along with things like you know, the company's mission and, and purpose in the world and how you're working to make the world a better place. Um, and I think as well, uh, applying as much uh, flexibility as possible to the candidate criteria, particularly in this sort of um, tight uh, candidate market. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just uh, I, I think that's uh, um, a really interesting point about the type of firm you want to uh, uh, you want you want to portray yourself as, and I was speaking to a couple of CEOs a few months ago and they were talking about, you know, I like martial artists, right? They, they, they look at the guys that have done martial arts, black belt, you know, they, they think they're tough, they think they, they can follow a, 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 a syllabus. One guy, uh, the other guy liked uh, people that were surfers or people that had done something a bit different. Um, and we'd just done an event on LGBT issues, um, first one I'd ever done. And I said to him, well, you know, if you want to show sort of how you're diverse and, you know, how you're open-minded and, you know, a little bit funky, you know, what about uh, bringing in some LGBT issues? They completely ignored me and carried on talking about martial artists and, and surfers. Um, so, uh, which is, I thought was quite interesting because, yeah, I think, you know, maybe certain people are not too comfortable with that issue, but it seems to me that when you're talking about CSR activities, it's interesting to look at what are people actually looking at at the moment. And, you know, I think that changes over time. It's not always the same thing. And, uh, you know, my sense is that, um, uh, that, you know, actually LGBT issues is actually quite hot at the moment in Tokyo. Um, I think, you know, companies have got to think in terms of being sort of quite journalistic in a sense, in the sense that they can see the story. And I think at the moment, that's quite a hot topic, uh, certainly from, uh, from the preparation I did for that event. It was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite, quite fashionable. Uh, but anyway, I won't, uh, I won't belabor that. <laughs> but uh, um, so you're talk you, made, you, you said something about sort of selling the company, which obviously in a, in a buyer's market, it's, uh, it's always uh, 
it's always very important. You've got to make the, 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 the you've got to make the, the company attractive. What, what, would you give any specific advice or, uh, or any, any, any thoughts about what HR managers should be doing in order to how to sell their companies? Maybe it's not necessarily something that HR managers are accustomed to doing, but, but how do you get out there and become a, a brand employer, a company employer? How does a company brand itself as a good place to work, like Google has done so effectively? And Google doesn't even pay that much, right? I mean, Google is not one of the highest payers in Silicon Valley, but they've got amazing benefits. They've got the Google bus. They've created that sort of really family-type atmosphere, which actually is ironic because it's kind of taking over some of the ideas of Japanese traditional companies, you know, which 10 or 20 years ago were focusing on building a family, a sense of togetherness. Some of the Silicon Valley firms have done that very, very well. Apple, of course, Google. Um, but anyway, what are your, what, do you have any specific recommendations to HR managers about that? Sure. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I think HR has, has a very important role to play in the process, and I think um, mainly actually around, I think, focusing on uh, on the process more so probably than the outcome, although I think that's, that's important. But uh, I, I think it can often happen that when, uh, you know, the, the process starts and, and people are meeting candidates that line managers are not sufficiently prepared to... Uh, you know, know, firstly know how to conduct an interview and also to, to sell the opportunities that exist within their company. I think um, the old style model of interviewing where, you know, the, the hiring manager sits up there with the arms crossed saying, well, so tell me, why should you join my company? Um, unfortunately, it doesn't apply anymore. But uh, the, the, the thing is that HR has a role there, I think, to make sure that line managers realise that. Because I think it, a lot of times they, they often, it, it escapes them, especially if they're not doing a lot of hiring. And, and they think back to, you know, when they interviewed for, a, for the company many, many years ago, that that was the style. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a role that can be played there by HR. Um, also, looking at the process in general. You know, in, in a candidate short market, time is of the essence. If you dally too long by putting maybe too many steps in the process, of course you want to make, make sure you're assessing people and getting it right, but there's, there's a, a balance to be had there between assessing and getting it right and taking too many steps and then losing a candidate because you're too slow. So I think you know, making sure that that's happening. Uh, also, you know, feedback is, is being obtained and, and passed to if, if you're doing it through a recruiting firm that that feedback is being passed to the recruiter, uh, but all, if, if not, maybe directly to the candidate and make sure that the process keeps moving and that everyone's being informed. Uh, and as, uh, HR can be a, a really, really powerful force in that. Uh, also, I think it's important to consider all sources of candidates to work with and, and work with, you know, re recruiters have always been a proportion of a company's hiring. That's never changed and we never you know, suspect that we're going to be 100% of, of uh, firms um, hiring. But um, there are always going to be avenues, and I think you know, companies should be open to all avenues to, to hire people. When they use recruiters, I think you should look carefully. I think you should use a limited number of recruiters and, and screen carefully on those recruiters. Make sure you're working with a quality recruiter and one that's going to, you can, in, it's worth you investing the time to understand your business and they're focused on developing a partnership with you. Um, there's little to be gained, I think, for, for any company to be going out to, you know, 20 recruiters all at the same time and hoping that everyone's going to jump up and down and do lots of work on the role. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, you know, that's something that's, that's worth considering. Um, and also making sure that line managers are willing to invest the time that will take to get a good candidate. I think a lot of times uh, line managers and CEOs will do this idea of, well, you know, it's, it's HR's job. Mm. You know, HR, you look after that. Take care of it for me. Just have, have the person ready to start for me on Monday. Um, and then they're, they're not always, you know, completely happy with the results. Well, in order to get the good results, the line managers have got to be prepared to put the time into, you know, certainly briefing HR, certainly briefing the recruiter on, on what it is exactly they want so that they can get the right candidates. And then also be prepared to invest the time to properly interview the candidates, give feedback on the candidates, and uh, you know, make sure that they're available to, to provide the necessary information to make the process go smoothly. So I think um, th those would be my, my mm -hmm. sort of main tips on what I think HR could, could do. Yeah, so broadly, I think the idea of getting line managers involved is, is, 
uh, is, is really interesting. And just going back to the, the thing about recruiters, I was speaking to an American uh, tech CEO a few months ago, um, and he said, we, we had an event, a Delphi Network event on this topic, it's obviously very hot, and he said he would invite recruiters to his company events. And the other CEOs were like quite surprised, and they said, and he said, yeah, at the beginning, his, uh, his colleagues didn't want this to happen. They, oh my God, they're going to poach everyone away. Then he sort of had to show them that actually there's a, you know, you, you, you need partners in this game, right? You need, you need to work with people that you trust and you need to, and don't sort of get away from that sort of oppositional uh, attitude, which I thought uh, was, I mean, he's very much ahead of the curve at that event, but, uh, but I thought it was a, a very sort of smart way of thinking about it, right? Um, now you've talked about HR, you've talked about line managers. Uh, what about the CEO? What's the role of the CEO? Um, I, I think the, the CEO also has a role to play uh, in, in recruitment throughout the whole organisation. Um, one of the things that, you know, I, I've sort of attended a few CEO, regularly attend a lot of CEO functions actually, and, and in, in talking to a lot of them, every, almost everyone says, my number one challenge in Japan is finding the right people. And it's, it's interesting for when, when you sort of delve into, okay, well, what, exa what do you do to, uh, to find the right people? Um, and mostly I think a lot of them are very involved in finding the people that report directly to them. And I think that's, uh, that's great, but I think, and I fully understand for, for CEOs that it's very, very difficult, obviously, to get involved in the recruit, you know, meeting every single person that comes into a large organisation, it can't happen. But I think, uh, as in for the HR folks, they need to have oversight of the process and make sure that they're set up in a way to uh, deliver the, the right candidates for them to be able to hire. I mean, ca case in point, I, I, just to tell a little story, I went to, um, I was coming out of one of these CEO functions and I met uh, one of the CEOs who uh, is running a you know, large foreign company here. Uh, we had a brief conversation. I said, oh, I think that, um, you know, we've been working with your company for a while. I said, you know, to be honest, it's been a bit of a challenge. We've, we've been trying, but we haven't been able to, to find many of the right candidates. And uh, he said, oh, really? And I said, yeah, look, I've, I've got some interesting ideas um, that I, I might be able to share with you uh, that, that might help. And um, so we arranged a lunch and, and we um, sat down and, and talked about the, the process. And he said to me, well, I, I don't understand how, how you, you couldn't be presenting the right candidates. So I said, well, okay, Let, let's talk through how, do, how does it happen. So uh, he said to me, well, what we do is that... Um, we gather, we have a regular meeting, we gather all the, the line managers together, the, the most senior people in the company, and we gather all the, the HR generalists and, who are responsible for all of this, and we make sure that we share all the information uh, to, to the HR generalists, um, who are then responsible for making sure that they get out to the recruiters and, and that all the information goes out to you guys. And uh, I said, well, that, that's great, but did you know that they're not the people we actually are in contact with. Really? And uh, I said, yes, there's, uh, there's a, a bunch of very, very junior people who have about one to two years experience who are our main contacts within the firm and the ones that give us the job description. And by the way, did you know that the job description comes through a web portal? And we're not allowed to contact anyone to get any more information than that. And. Uh, he, w he was absolutely stunned. He had no idea that this was going on within his own organisation. And so we, we sort of had a bit of a conversation and we talked a bit further on and we said, um, did you, he said to us, did you know that I have um, three of my direct report positions are currently open and I'm looking to fill people? No, nope, we had no idea. So um, he, was, he was surprised at the level of filtering that was going on, the decision making that was happening um, as to who, you know, where these roles were being put in front of. And he was complaining, he hadn't seen any candidates, nothing had been happening. So this is where I think it's very, when I say to, to CEOs, I think it's very important to make sure that if you want to get the best people and you want to make sure that you, you're getting the right people, that you're actively involved in what's happening because you might be surprised to find out what's really going on.
Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, these web portals. Um, I mean, I was speaking to some guy yesterday, and he was, he, I told him about what I was doing today, and he said, well, you know, what is it with these uh, recruiters? I mean, everyone's got LinkedIn now. I mean, do, is that going to be a, I mean, is that, and of course, LinkedIn is free, lots of data. Is this something that's going to undermine your business? Is this something that HR people are going to be working more with to your detriment, or how, how's that going to pan out? Uh, well, that's interesting. This is a question I get asked qu quite a bit. Um, is, isn't it the end of your industry now that LinkedIn's here? Um, and it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I was uh, around recruiting uh, in the early 2000s, or, or late 90s as well, actually, uh, without giving away my age. But uh, um, <laughs> we, uh, in those days, it was about the time when we started to see the, uh, the introduction of job boards and uh, monster.com and I was actually working for a company at the time that got acquired by monster.com and uh, they said that's it you know end of the world for recruiters you know hiring managers should go online now and they can find the people they want they'll have access to everybody and um, the interesting thing that I've seen in that time is that our industry has grown multiple times and just like that, LinkedIn in the same way has been around for several years now and our industry has continued to grow in size. And the, what I put it down to is that the, we, we've only ever, as, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we're not the totality of most companies hiring uh, sources. They use a variety of sources. And that's always been the case. There's always been um, newspaper ads. There's always been personal networks. Um, all this type of thing. So that's that's always and so to that extent, nothing's really changed. What's what's been different about LinkedIn is that now, I suppose everybody has access to everybody else's information, right? And so hiring managers can go on there and they can find someone and they can make the contact. But and maybe in some instances that might cut us out of the picture. But the. The problem is that what people overlook is that everybody has that information, hmm. right? It's not exclusive to any company. And so the candidates themselves are a hell of a lot more informed. And they're getting approached by so many different companies. I mean, and so what is really increasingly needed in that sort of environment in, a, in an environment where candidates are very, very knowledgeable about firms, have opinions and, and that kind of thing, good people know, are increasingly knowing their worth, they're making sure that their companies are looking after them, and in, in that sort of environment, what's needed are people who can convince a candidate to choose this company over that company. And so, what actually LinkedIn in many ways is, is going to see, I think, an even in, bigger growth, or going to cause in some ways an even bigger growth in, in our, our industry. So, uh, so that's something that, that mm. you know, we, we see with LinkedIn. Um, so I, I don't particularly see it as a, as a, as a threat no, at all. No, yeah, yeah. Um, and also the other thing I would say, just add on that, um, I, there are a lot of profiles on LinkedIn that are either fake, fraudulent, um, or have been doctored. And uh, I think increasingly it's going to need people who can sort through that too. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the candidates, because that, also, that also crossed my mind that LinkedIn is a great tool for the candidates, right? They can see a lot of uh, things going on, but maybe it's a less powerful tool for companies who aren't really able to brand themselves on that uniform interface. If you're a company, you've got, you, know, you, you basically comply with the, the LinkedIn look and you can't really uh, stand out. Um, and going back to the role of the, so, so perhaps we're seeing a divergence, right, where sort of lower level jobs, and I think uh, you know, this maybe ties in with artificial intelligence and lower, you know, with, there's been a lot of uh, the rise of the machines by that American author, is it Robert Cap? I don't think it was. Anyway, the rise of the robot uh, taking over a lot of lower level jobs. Um, but the higher level jobs, those candidates are getting more and more in demand, which means that. I think you use the word to persuade or to convince, and that's, that's a sort of crucial skill that is perhaps a very sort of specialist skill in a sense, right? And uh, that human interface, a guy that's getting a lot of phone calls, or like, you know, he's not, he wants to actually meet with someone that, he, that presumably he feels, he can, that he can feels is honest and can have a relationship with him and that can uh, you know, be, become a real partner. So do you see this sort of divergence, sort of 
LinkedIn for the or, or sort of, you know, web portals for the lower level jobs and sort of a, uh, sort of a, a recruiters going sort of up market as it were, so we're going higher value? Perhaps, perhaps. So, I mean, it's, it's probably a little early to tell on mm -hmm. that, but uh, it, it's interesting there was a report released very recently that said that uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, 40 47% of jobs in Japan are going to disappear uh, from artificial intelligence. So it is going to be a factor, it is going to be something that we're going to see uh, a lot more of. And what, what I think that means is that jobs will become increasingly about ideas and the ability to implement those ideas. So uh, in that sort of instance, you've got people who really you, you're going to see, as I said, a lot of the lower level jobs being taken over by uh, artificial intelligence, the more uh, higher paying jobs and, and the ones that many of you companies are going to be looking to hire will be more about, as I said, ideas and, and uh, um, people who are able to implement those ideas. And those people are going to be very knowledgeable, very sought after, and uh, it's going to be a challenge to get them across the line. But uh, Dan, I think maybe we, yep. we might like to actually cut it short here. Yep. Uh, we're on time. So maybe uh, we could open the floor to um, any questions that people might have uh, about anything that sort of we've spoken about or, or any other related topics. Happy to try and answer. Gosh. <laughs> Maybe we have answered everything, Dan. <laughs> uh, yes. And then there's back on the left. Yes. What about uh, ways to uh, re-engage women uh, in the workforce? We've heard a lot about that from the, uh, the politicians uh, in our industry. There's a large number of uh, designers and uh, merchandisers and females, but getting them to re-engage uh, after they've either been married or uh, they've had children has been a struggle. Your interviews on that would be appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, um, a very complex problem, and obviously one that the, uh, the Abe administration has been, uh, been trying very hard to, to wrestle with. Uh, and one of the things that I, I'd like to sort of point out here, that the uh, percentage of women in management in Japan is just 11.3% of, of managerial positions held by women. Uh, uh, Robert Walters, we 50% of our placements are female, and 40% uh, of our permanent placements uh, are female. So, um, and we're predominantly dealing with the, the foreign multinationals. So 85% of our revenue comes from foreign multinationals. So I think uh, in many ways, uh, foreign companies are, are you know, doing their best on that front. Um, but it's a multifaceted problem. Uh, I think the, the other administration has been trying to put in a few uh, measures that I think will have some effect and I certainly I think have got people talking about this as an issue much more. So things that I could point to is the, the requirement now for companies to set targets on the, uh, the level of the number of women that they have in, in managerial roles and for those listed companies they're required to report them in their annual report uh, how they've gone against those targets. Uh, and then also I think the Tok Tokyo Stock Exchange has got that uh, Nadeshko list of, of uh, 26 Japanese companies that are doing progressive things uh, related to the empowerment of women in the workforce. So uh, it's certainly been a topic that's been a lot more talked about, but uh, it's, it's, it's a, a multi-headed monster, uh, if you like, because I think so much of the problem is, is rooted in culture. And uh, the idea that, uh, I mean, even just recently, there was a survey I saw that said um, something like 51% of, of, they serve a sort of general population, and uh, something like 51% as, as recently as 2013, I think it was, something like 51% of, of people surveyed still felt that uh, women's place was in the home. Uh, you know, while ever that sort of idea about society exists, it's, it's gonna be pretty hard to, to increase the level of participation because I think what, what I understand of the, of the challenges of particularly Japanese women to participate in the workforce here, it's, it's everything. It's, it's the, the parents, you know, and the parents' expectation of whether or not they should be working once they got married and have had kids. Um, they've got to work against perhaps entrenched male attitudes from, from the men around them. 
Uh, I, I think there's also issues with um, obviously daycare facilities. I, I think the, uh, the sort of standard working hours of most Japanese companies are, are a big barrier to uh, be not just men and women, but I think families in general. And the fact that people have got to live uh, often times an hour or two hours commute away from their workplace. I think when you know, you've got a situation where you've got two people in, you know, both parents having to commute for two hours on the end of a, you know, 11, 12 hour day, uh, that would just mean you never see a kid. And so uh, usually the choice comes down, well, who's going to, going to give up their job? Uh, and um, unfortunately, inevitably, it, it's, it's, it's the woman who, who gives it up. And so uh, until these sorts of attitudes change, I think it's going to be very hard to see meaningful change. But I do think that uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more companies doing things to, to, um, to attract women and, and keep them in the workforce. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Bartek, Bartek yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Bartek from Webasta. I have a question, uh, I guess about a year, a year and a half ago when uh, Japan was awarded the Olympics, there was a big you know, euphoria from this, but a lot of companies started to say like, okay, what will happen after 2020? Yes. And uh, looking at the new, the local, the Japanese news and uh, talking to my customers, it seems that a lot more people are a little bit more relaxed about the 21, 22, and onward. Do you see this kind of, uh, let's say, hesitation towards the after Olympics changing, or is still uh, prevalent uh, within the customers? Um, I, I, th I think it might depend a lot on the, the customer, uh, or sorry, the, the, the particular company we're talking about. Uh, so I, got, I was doing a, a press conference on, on this yesterday, and uh, uh, I got asked the question, well, you know, what do you think, you know, this is all very positive, you know, how do you think things are going to play out for 2016? You know, we've seen Ford pulling out of the market, you know, Barclays has closed their equities desk, oh my gosh, you know, um, is, this, is this the turning point? Is this where we see things going downhill from here? And, um, you know, 2020 and beyond maybe, you know, these, these similar ideas. But I actually think that um, it's, it's not going to be what people imagine. I think there's still plenty of opportunities. Uh, this is still a very, very big market and there are a lot of opportunities for both Japanese and foreign companies alike. Uh, you've only got to take the plight, uh, well, well the, the fortunes of, of say a company like Apple. Um, and this is one that I've, I referred to that um, at, you know, 10 years ago who had an Apple phone or, or, or an Apple product even. And now it's pretty hard to find people without one. And so uh, the reason they've been successful is they've had a better product than anything that was being made in Japan. And uh, you know, when I look at, say, the future of, of what I see happening in Japan you know, for the next few years and, and 2020, um, I think that there is an enormous opportunity for companies to be more global here and to compete with global products and, and global ways of doing business. Because uh, and I think the, the fortunes, recent fortunes of some of the Japanese, former Japanese powerhouses like, you know, Sharp and, and, and Sony and, and these sorts of companies uh, really highlight that. And so when I, you know, for example, if I look at the Robert Walters business and, and what I, I think we could see from us, the, the demand for bilingual staff, for example, is going to continue to go through the roof. Um, we're, we're not going to see an end to that, I don't think, anytime soon. Um, the needs just keep going up as, as you know, companies expand here, Japanese companies become more global. Um, you know, these, these skill shortages that we're talking about now, um, they're nothing compared to what's coming. Mm. Mm. I'd just like to pick up on the womanomics thing. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, be, it's, been a, it's been a trope. It's been going on for a long, long time. I mean, from an economic point of view, it, it doesn't really matter if the work is done by a man or a woman, right? Um, the output is the same, but what, so um, and you could argue that you don't need more labor in the in the. It's not a supp supply problem in Japan, right? It's a demand problem. Right? Martin Wolf had a, had a nice summary of the issue in the FT the other day. Um, consumption is relatively low. Um, uh, there's all th th those are the issues. You know, you're not getting enough uh, of that recycling of wages, spending, people going out there buying their washing machines, cars, uh, people aren't buying houses anymore, that used to be the biggest uh, household investment, that's fallen off a cliff. 
Um, so if you think of, sort of women as part of the workforce as adding to the supply, it's not necessarily particularly, from an economic point of view, it's neutral, right? It doesn't matter. But, and, but there is an, a layer which is important, and that's the skill set. Um, and that is actually, irrespective of their sex, the fact is that women do have these, uh, do have uh, certain skills which are very attractive to, 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 to globalizing companies. And especially the English language, at a very basic level, you see a massive divergence between women and men in terms of their uh, English language ability. And even greater in the, uh, I've got a note in my pr presentation here talking about male engineers that can speak English. I mean, that is like, you know, you're really talking at a, a really shrinking uh, pool there. So just one comment on the, uh, on the woman almost. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, I'm conscious that we're keeping people between, uh, well, well, keeping people away from food. But uh, um, I think we've probably got time for just one more question. Does anybody have anything else they would like to ask? I'm guessing not. All right. Well, uh, well thank you all very much. Uh, please uh, enjoy, enjoy the lunch, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, Dan and I perhaps can get around and, and talk to uh, many of you face-to-face -face, uh, very soon. Thank you very much.